Hello, uh, my name is Tracy Davenport, and I don't really have too much of a backstory with dogs, other than the fact that I always wanted one, and I was never allowed to have one. I'm from the States originally, and we moved over to the UK in 1980, and because we were fl flying back and forth to the States quite a lot, my parents said there's no way you can ever have a pet. So I finally settled over here, I got married, I had children, and it seemed like a really good time. And for years, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine who I'd worked with, had always told me about these bulldogs that he had seen. And he met this guy, he had the biggest dog he'd ever seen. He said it was the friendliest, loveliest, chunkiest thing. I was like, well, what is it? Tell me about it. So it's called a Sussex Bulldog, but I've never heard anything about them other than that. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, going back maybe 15 years. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't, you know, a great deal on the internet. You know, I Googled them, but there wasn't a lot there. So I kind of let it pass for a while. And then eventually my husband agreed to letting me have a dog. And this was... Uh, four years ago now, maybe five, coming close to five. And um, I had seen that a litter had been born. So I contacted the Sussex Bulldog Association and I spoke with their secretary and arranged to go and meet her. She had three of her own at the time, two females and a male. Yeah. And I just wanted to see them in person, see, you know, you can, you can get an idea of what an animal is like through an image, but you don't get a true reflection of how they are, what they're, you know, really like, how they move, how they behave, how they interact yeah. with other dogs, how they interact with humans. So um, we went along to meet her, and her dogs were just spectacular. They were gorgeous, yeah. gorgeous. So the next step was is that I arranged to go and meet Jay, Jay McDonald. He's one of our breeders. And he was the one that had had the litter at the time. And it was a massive litter. All of these dogs have huge litters. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a litter of 12 pied and white, uh, black, and, black and white pieds, and also solid blacks. Uh, and because I was kind of late to the party, I kind of, there was only a few left that hadn't already been chosen. but. The one that I picked was the smallest of the litter. She was the runt. She was the, you know, the scruffiest little thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and she was a handful. She was made up for it. Um, but when I went to meet her, uh, I saw her father and her mother. And compared to the dogs that I'd met previously, they were enormous. They were mm -hmm. so big. So again, I was, I found myself just completely gobsmacked. Um, so anyway, I, I chose this little puppy and then, um, you know, a few weeks later I was able to go collect it, bring it home. And it was for me as never having had a dog before, it was a bit of a baptism of fire, you know, right, I was just... just, um, she, as with all of them, they have very much their own mind and their, their own will. And to go with it, they're very strong animals, the bigger they get, obviously. Mm -hmm. So I spent a lot of time reading. I read uh, a lot of Cesar Milan books, which I found helped me loads, um, and did a lot of research about how I should be with them. And that did the trick beautifully. You know, she, in the beginning, she really took advantage of me Mm -hmm. uh, hang on. This thing is, you know, she's three months old and she's ruling the roost. I need to change things. Mm -hmm. So once I learned a lot more and I learned how to treat her, learned how she could fit into the family, it was great. It was absolutely brilliant. She was the, you know, the best animal I, I ever owned. She was just amazing. She was my best friend. You know, I took her everywhere with me. I took her to business meetings. Um, you know, I took her to the pub, I took her out to restaurants, I took her everywhere. I was never without her. Mm -hmm. She was the most amazing animal. 
Um, so eventually, uh, David Brown, who is the creator of the breed, approached me and he said, look, you know, she's a really good specimen of the breed. Um, would you be open to, to breeding her? And I said, you know, of course, you know, she was such an amazing dog. I, I felt ashamed to not pass that on. So we bred her. And a little over a year ago, she had a litter, and oh. she, <laughs> which was amazing. And she was bred with actually an, a, a much older dog. So luckily for me, it was quite a small litter. Um, sadly, she had a fall um, about 10 days after she had the litter and became paralyzed. Oh. And, uh, we had to say goodbye to her about a week mm. later. And then I had wow. to head puppies but we had to try and keep her alive long enough so that I could get the puppies weaned um, so that was a really difficult time uh, but mm -hmm. I did have the puppies who I've named Bunny and I mm -hmm. have her now just like her mother very tenacious real handful but I wouldn't have her any other way she's amazing mm -hmm. um, so um, as I said I, I said goodbye to, the, to her mother and then I had the, the four puppies that I raised here. And then uh, David, David, David was wonderful. He was such a huge help. He was there at the end of the phone, you know, at all hours of the day because I'd never done it before. Mm -hmm. I had a clue really how things worked in practice. You, you mm -hmm. know, again, you read about how things should be and how it's supposed to be, but until you have first-hand experience, you're never really too sure. So he was really uh, a, an amazing guiding hand through the whole experience. Mm -hmm. So he and I um, and uh, a lady called Nicola Jardine, she and I and he, we all found um, good homes for them, which isn't easy because um, David is very particular about who the puppies go to. He mm -hmm. wants them to just go out to anybody because it only takes one poor owner to ruin the reputation of breed, and that's his lifetime's mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. So every every owner for every single one of these dogs is handpicked. So we found lovely, lovely fa families for all of mine. Uh, David actually kept one of them himself, uh, and he's called Norton. Bit of a handful mm -hmm. as well. <laughs> Hmm. Um, that that was all lovely, and because it was such a traumatic experience losing my best friend, David very kindly, um, with the next litter that was born, he he gifted me a puppy from that a litter, which was incredible. Um, and it, it, it he said, you know, it, it's not a replacement, but it's just an acknowledgement of what you did for us and for the breed and you know I've had a litter you come and choose whichever one you want so I got to pick uh, uh, my second puppy Dallas so I have two bitches Bunny and Dallas and Bunny is now um, almost 14 months and Dallas is 10 months so I have my hands full at the minute but mm -hmm. I wouldn't have any other day they're uh, very different personalities Dallas is just, she just wants to cuddle you and snuggle all the time. But she's also extremely playful. Um, and Bunny is very clever and sharp and has a real mind of her own. And, you know, I take her out to the woods and I love watching her run. So she goes out into the woods and she runs and she jumps over all of the trees and chases things and She's so beautiful. She's like like watching a deer almost. Mm -hmm. And then Dallas is more of a traditional bulldog mover. She's, you know, solid. She'll go through anything. <laughs> you know? right. um, but yeah, I've got, I've got pretty much the two extremes of what you can have in the breed okay. in terms of personality and appearance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I wouldn't have it any other way. They're just so lovely and they bring so much to my family. They're perfect with the kids. You know, the kids just hang all over them. You know, they're so robust and tough. They can take anything. Mm -hmm. I, 
trust them 100%. And I have known other dogs in the past, but couldn't say that I have ever trusted them 100% with my children. Mm-hmm. These guys, I'm, I've never had the slightest bit of concern. You know, mm-hmm. they belong to this family. They know their place in this family. And it just makes it all work so well. So now that the girls are a little bit older, I've started them doing agility, which has been okay. lovely. And I also take them to weekly dog training, which is... You need, they need to walk on a lead properly. And you need to know that they're not going to pull you over if they see a squirrel. And you need to know mm-hmm. that they're not chase after other dogs. Because they're quite, the way that they look can be quite intimidating to many other dog owners. They mm-hmm. see them coming and they think, oh God, you know, it's going to eat my little terrier or something. Mm-hmm. But they're not like that at all. They just, they love the company of other dogs. Um, I put the, I had them in the kennels actually at the weekend. And um, there's a, a, a man here and he's been a dog man all his life. He's always owned and trained gun dogs and he owns a kennel now and he has a big field where he lets all of the dogs out and he said oh i'm just gonna assess your two just to make sure they'll be all right he said just like bunny's mother he said i can't fault them the way that they interact with other dogs they're very respectful but they don't take any nonsense they don't start trouble they like to play he said i couldn't ask for better guests to interact with the rest of the population of dogs. So, you know, hearing that is always really nice. Mm-hmm. You know, hearing, you always believe it in your heart, but hearing it from, from somebody that is a professional that's always worked with dogs, it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's really nice to hear. Right, so exactly. That's kind of where we're up to. Um, they they are very standard. Um, mm-hmm. okay. uh, you do occasionally you seem to get um, almost like a rogue that seems to be very large um, and almost like a mastiff. Uh, but the rest of them do tend to be of a very standard size. In mm-hmm. terms of coloring, um, you get all colors. Uh, there are brindles, there's black and whites, there's pies, there's chocolates, there's reds, there's, you know, there's there's everything really. So whatever color you fancy, you can pretty much get. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, let me see, Bunny, my black one, um, she's very muscular and lean, very athletic. Um, and... Because she's only sort of just one, I don't know how her head will fill out in terms of size. Um, mm-hmm. With my previous bit, she her head didn't complete growing until she was just over two years old. With Dallas, I could see that she is going to be much bigger than Bunny. She may mm-hmm. not be quite tall, but she's definitely stockier. She has a thicker neck, a broader set on the shoulders. Um, and her head is already bigger. And it does tend to be that the chocolates um, have the slight edge on the, the weightiness of their size and the head mm-hmm. size.
Come on. Come on. <laughs> Good girl. Slobbery girl. My previous bitch, she saddled at 45 kilos in weight. Okay. Okay. Um, and she was, you know, slightly on the larger size for a bitch. Mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, like I said, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm an owner. I'm fairly new mm -hmm. to it. Um, I'm incredibly passionate about the dogs. Um, I've just, you know, they're everything to me now. Mm -hmm. I love it. If there's a new litter that's born, I go and see them. I go and visit David's dogs all the time. I go and see Nicola's dogs. It's, I just love being with them. I love going out in a massive pack. You know, you have David's dogs, Nicholas' dogs, my dogs. They all go out together, and mm -hmm. it's a to be reckoned with when you see so many of them really tearing around and doing that rough bulldog play. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> it's absolutely love it. really love it. <laughs>
he overheated in the 75 uh, 75 day yeah just running up and down the fence for about 15 minutes yeah and we actually had to take him to the vet and get him fluids and get him some antibiotics so and we keep him at a very very healthy weight he's right at uh, 50 pounds and uh, he's pretty he's still agile and he's and he's still uh, pretty healthy for an English bulldog at five years old but you know the skin issues the breathing issues all of that is gonna going to you know end his life a lot sooner than I would want and my wife would want so um, that's why you know we and we put a lot of money into him already so you know, when you got a family, you got to think about those things on top of everything else. And so a healthier version of a bulldog is something that we're, we're looking into eventually. But I love bulldogs. And um, what attracted me to the Sussex was just their sheer size. But then their, they, they, they didn't have the um, – they were a little more proportioned. You know, um, Bunny is just seems to be very good at everything, all aspects. You know, she um, from standing, she can jump really high. Oh, wow! Uh, really, really high. Um, she is like a rabbit, <laughs> which is kind yeah. of why we call her Bunny because from the get go, she hopped everywhere. You know, as a mm -hmm. little puppy. And it just kind of stuck. Mm -hmm. um, extremely, she's an extremely fast runner. Um, she's, you know, very good at jumping. Um, I, mm -hmm. you know, I see that when I take her in the woods. She, she just flies through the woods. It darts in and out of the trees, jumps over the dead trees. She's so agile. Mm -hmm. So when I take her to the agility courses. You know, they were starting her off on very low jumps, and I was like, really, that's not going to be a problem. You know, she got off, and she was jumping over these jumps and going over the A-frames and through the tubes, and the woman was like, oh, she's not afraid, is she? And that's another thing. They're very confident, which um, which I, I have found in the past. It's dogs that are not confident are the ones that tend to bite. Um, and tend to be slightly more of a loose cannon. And these guys, they're all very confident in themselves and very secure. Um, and it doesn't seem to rile or create problems with other dogs, if you see what I mean. It's, it mm -hmm. brings things down. It calms things when they're in amongst a big group of dogs. Um, you know, they're just quiet and calm, you know? Mm -hmm. That was a proper vlog. <laughs> Is that fun, girls? And how else? Sorry, I'm, I'm not... Like I said, you know, I, I'm I'm just an owner, and I, I've not had dogs for terribly long compared to most people, and I can only speak about you know the, the things that I that I have personally experienced, but they are very confident. <laughs> right. And do they have kind of a, a, a natural uh, a guarding uh, tendencies, yeah. like at your house or your property? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, they're, they're really good with that. Um, where I live, I live in the countryside, um, but we also live near the sea. Um, and I have a, it's an upside down house, so we have a balcony. Mm -hmm. And when the dogs are out there, if, you know, there's a sheep field in front of the house. And when the dogs are out there, if they see other dogs 
you just hear you see the heckles go up and you hear the low rumble mm-hmm. you know uh, and it's it goes right through you it's it's for lack of a better term it's actually quite thrilling um to feel that um mm-hmm. but it's also good to know that they're always watching you know one of my dogs particularly um you know she ha- she has an alarm bark and it's very distinctive uh, and you know she hears you know an unusual noise outside of the house in the middle of the night you'll get that you'll get mm-hmm. an early um i know a lot of people try to train that sort of thing out of their dogs but i think part of part of the reason why i got i was my husband agreed to let me get a dog is because he often worked away and mm-hmm. I, I was you know, with the children and at the time we lived um much closer to a city um and there had been a spate of break-ins and things and i just felt a little bit you know vulnerable and having a dog gives you that confidence and it gives you that sense of security for yourself and for your children you know when you when you are on your own and i i know for a fact that i have nothing to worry about when they are here if there was ever mm-hmm. any danger, they would guard me with their lives uh, anybody anybody that is in our family in our house they would be there but they're also mm-hmm. not unnecessarily overboard if you see what i mean uh-huh. they're not right they're at every little thing that goes past they're generally very quiet dogs they're not not barkers um it's only really if they sense something to be alarmed about that you'll hear the bark mm-hmm. so, yeah right <laughs> Come on the board. Come on. There you go. looking for a very specific uh, uh combination of attributes and it took him a long time to get there but when mm-hmm. he did uh, because with all of the dogs since since he got the stability in what he was looking for only he can agree the pairings between any of the dogs and bitches out there mm-hmm. and he, himself and uh mr darren henwood i believe you've spoken to darren yeah 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 so those are the the only two that can um agree to the pairings because they go back through the family history to look at um you know who would be right for each other and also you know what's current what's currently available Mm -hmm. um you know it's not something that's taken lightly so um yeah, they, they handle all that side of things. Are you uh, are you planning on uh, breeding either one of your females, or that last experience make you gun shy? Did it very yeah. much did? Yeah, probably would be too. It wasn't because of the breeding, which is the thing that I have to remember. Yeah, and I think that it would be such a shame to not pop, not pass on the genes 
Mm-hmm. Dogs, are, and I know, of course, I'm biased because I love my dogs. You know, I love my yeah. dogs than any of yeah. the others. But I just, it would be such a shame not to pass it on. So I think, you know, and David had said to me, you know, very kindly, if that's something that we can come to an arrangement with, then he would take the bitch um, the week before she's due. And I know at the moment that he's uh, building um, a whelping kennel. Um, And he said, I can take her and manage that side of things through that period of time. Um, Mm. And, you know, basically take the workload off of my shoulders. Mm -hmm. He's been very, um, very kind and very generous through my experience. And I think that's part of the reason why, you know, I've another part of the, the whole thing that I'm attracted to in the breed is that, you know, he, he's a real stand up guy. You know, what you see is what you get and what he tells you is gonna happen is going to happen. They don't you don't get much around. You know, you know where you're at. And you know that if you ever at any point needed help with any of your dogs, you know, they will take them back. You know, if you for example, I know in the past that a few of the owners they have lived in rented accommodation and had to move and have been unable to take the dogs with them. So the association takes them back in and finds them new homes and manages all of that, you know, to make sure that they're going into place instead of into shelters. So, you know, again, I just feel that it's all very responsibly done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the genuine, uh, you know, due care and attention to each and every one of these animals. Right. Absolutely. The animals are so black that you can't see them. <laughs> Feeding a dog and two shadows. In kind of talking about the living situation, how do you think they would handle kind of more of an urban environment, say like in a, a townhouse or a row house, whatever you want to call it, or an apartment? Do you think they would be all right as long as they got exercise? Or They would be, yeah. Um, yeah. Where I lived previously was, uh, was much more urban. Mm-hmm. Uh, we lived very close to the city, um, and my previous dog, we... As I said, I took her to, you know, I had a lot of meetings in the city and I would take her with me and she was always fine. No mm-hmm. problem. Um, but, you know, that they, they are a big dog that has a lot of energy. So mm-hmm. that does need to be used. If you don't, you know, a, a tired dog is a good dog. And it's not just physical activity. I mean, I, I walk my dogs you know, it is a commitment. It's a lifestyle having mm-hmm. dogs like, um, you know, I walk my dogs normally between an hour and a half, two hours a day. Um, but beyond that, for exhaust to, to wear them out, you have to do training to mentally exhaust them because the more you walk them, the fitter they get. So you'll never, you know, you'll never get to a point where they're like, nah, I mean, I, I used to run a lot, and with my previous dog, I'd run up to 17 miles, and she wow. was okay. With it. Wow. Yeah. You know, for a 45-kilo dog, that's yeah. not bad going. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. That's great.
I mean, that's just a, an indication of, you know, how how sporting they are. Mm-hmm. You know, they're uh, you know I always refer to my my bitches as being game because they're game for it. They're always yeah. up for whatever challenge you, you put in front of them. You know, mm-hmm. and they always do it. But it, you know, like I said, the the training is key. You mm-hmm. need you know with any dog. You need to train yeah. if you want it to blend into society well. And, you know, when you've got two big dogs, that's even more important because mm-hmm. it's always the person with the small dog that says, your dog bit my dog or your dog attacked my dog, your dog is harassing my dog. And, the, you know, the fact of the matter is it's always like the Jack Russells that come up and bite your dog first. You know, if my dog were to behave that way, you would have it put down. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know the Jack Russell's always the one that comes along and gets underneath and tears the stomach out of another dog, and they're like, "Oh, but it's only little." And I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those those dogs, yeah. People underestimate those the, those breeds for sure, especially the ones that are bred to hunt. So yeah, yeah, they're yeah. Very, very, very aggressive. Yeah. Yeah. See a lot of that here. Being in the countryside, you get a lot of ratters. <laughs> yeah, a lot of you see a lot of patterdales and a lot of yeah, mm-hmm. jaggeds yeah, and a lot of Jack Russells. Dogs, sure. dogs. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, a lot of hunting dogs, ratters, sheep yeah. dogs. It's a lot of working dogs, which is yeah. great. I mean, brilliant that the dogs are working. Yeah. That's what they should be doing. Exactly. And that, you know, part of my philosophy with my dogs is that they have to earn their food and so I, like, I've only just given them their breakfast and it's one o'clock mm-hmm. because I didn't get a chance earlier to take them out and walk them and do the training mm-hmm. that I need to do with them but they have to wait until that's all done before right. they get their right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah well that's good that's smart and it, it kind of gives uh it comes. It also breeds a little more loyal dog too. The one that has uh, structure and training, and there's a special connection that you get from that. That I think yeah. people miss out on that don't do that. So yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So um, did, uh, did when David created the breed, did did he have any kind of work jobs that he was want these dogs to do like any uh professional guardian or personal protection or or hunting or anything like that was he i think um because as i said before he um comes from a working dog background so i think mm-hmm. mostly like sheep dogs and farm dogs um and i know in the, er- the early days he placed quite a few of them into farms for working purposes, and um, some of them went into hunt as well. Um, and I know that all of them did very well at whichever given uh, home they were put into. I know um, they, you know, they they were very successful. I don't know where he specifically had in mind for them, but I mm-hmm. think given that he put them into hunt and into farm work is an mm-hmm. indication that he mentally had them placed. But to get the true answer to that, you know, you might have yeah. to ask him that question. Right. Uh-uh. This way. Dallas. This way. This way. Come on, let's go. Is there any uh, kennel club that does recognize them as a registry or? No, no, not at the moment. And I know that it was something that um, 
Certainly at one point, David was looking to work towards. I don't know if that is still the case um, because there um, there's a few issues, I think, with Kennel Club registered dogs or the way that the Kennel Club is run here in the UK. Um, you know, I, I know that it's something that he was looking at at one point, but I don't know if he has continued with that at the moment or whether he's just very busy and can't at the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's it's one of those things that they, over here there have been a lot of programs on about the English Bulldog. And they had they interviewed a lot of the key breeders in this country regarding them. And then they also interviewed um, owners, such as myself, but, uh, you know, as you are, um, and vets. And everybody was giving their perspective on the British Bulldog. And it seemed very strange to me that um, all of the breeders that were kennel club and, you know, very well known in the kennel club felt that the way that they were breeding was that they, they didn't see a problem with it. Um, and they were using basically a given gene pool, you know, standard, uh, the gene pool that there is and just interbreeding and interbreeding and interbreeding. And the offset of that is that the problems that these dogs have been suffering with um, is the offset. The offset is that they're becoming worse over time. So if you look back to, for example, 1980, um, the problems with the, the British Bulldog um, were less than you see now. Uh -huh. So it's getting exacerbated over time because it's becoming more inbred. Um, and this is what the, the vets that were interviewed were having to say. And mm -hmm. a lot of the experts were obviously, you know, very heartbroken because they had so many health issues and they couldn't afford to constantly pay out. Insurance companies mm -hmm. won't pay out. And if you have a bulldog or, or a dog that is classed as a bulldog, your pet insurance is three times as much as it is for any other breed. So mm -hmm. people can't afford the insurance. So, you know, one of the things about the Sussex Bulldog is that because it's not a kennel club registered breed, in terms of insurance, I can get a much reduced rate. Uh, okay. Fast as a Bulldog cross or, a, you know, Mastiff cross or, you know, it can be sort of classed in a different way. So you can kind of get around that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in terms of the Kennel Club, I think until they straighten a few things out in their ideology of how the dog should be bred, um, I think it's kind of, it's a bit off-putting to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't it is like with Frenchies and the Pugs and all of these type dogs, people are breeding them in excess and they're causing so many problems. It's just heartbreaking. Yeah, no, and those are two great breeds that are going to go straight down the same path that the English Bulldog has. So, yeah, yeah, yeah it's sad to see. Yeah, I hope the, I hope they can correct it someday. But until then, like, I'll be looking at something like the Sussex or something on those lines with my next Bulldog. So, oh, um, we can over to you. <laughs> yeah. First person in America, funnily, funnily enough, um, there were a few people that I know in the States that were uh, family, friends, that were interested in getting one. <laughs> so, yeah, you'll have to let me know if that's the way you want to go, though, for sure. I'll hook you up. Yeah, <laughs> right. I appreciate that. We'll, we'll stay in contact.
Uh, do you guys do any kind of showing or anything like that? Um, David, there, did, you... he had he did have an annual show which went on for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. I think um, basically that had been run for quite a few years, but then um, David's work life kind of took over uh, and he, he's been really uh, busy for the past couple of years and hasn't been able to facilitate doing it. Um, again, it's something that we would love to, to bring back uh, mm -hmm. because it's just so lovely to see all the all of these magnificent dogs together. So it's it's one of those little plans that Nicola and I are hatching together. So I wouldn't be okay. surprised to see it again in the next few years. Okay. Well, we do have an annual meet always. I mean, we've uh -huh. met um, two or three times this year, so yeah. that's a brilliant anyway. But in terms of an, an official show with placements and you know going around a ring and seeing the movement and you know checking the stature of the dogs, we need to get on board with that. <laughs> right, absolutely. Well, when you do have a litter, uh, I, I want to see the puppies. So. Plan on uh, for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Oh, it's been right. great talking about my favorite subject. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Me too. All right. Take, Take care. care. Uh -huh. Bye bye. bye.